We're continuing our theme that we're doing over these few weeks between uh, the new year and the start of Lent of songs of praise. Um, the Psalms have often been described as the hymn book of the Bible. Their poetry, the Psalms, are songs. They are written very often in absolute praise and adoration of God. I mean, they are all written in praise and adoration of God to some extent, but some are real direct um, acclamations of worship. And the Psalms that we're looking at during these weeks would come into that category. As we've been looking from Psalm 96, and uh, we're going through to Psalm 100. So Psalm 98, let's um, uh, turn to that and um, read that psalm. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and received his righteousness uh, to the nations. Sorry, revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing. With the trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. As we look at these psalms, we see that there is this common theme of praise and uh, as you go through, particularly in these psalms, approaching the 100th psalm, there does seem to be an awful lot of jubilance, of praise, of music, of singing and dancing that's taking place. These are real psalms of praise. You could say that the psalmist in this particular one got a little bit carried away. I mean, he's not just saying to the people, come on, let's go and sing to the Lord. Let's make some music. Let's have a wonderful time. But you'll notice that as well as telling the people, and not just the people, say, in the temple, but he's talking to the people of all the earth. Verse 4, shout for joy to the Lord. All the earth burst into jubilant songs with music. So he's told everybody, you're to praise God. And then, as I say, he gets really carried away. And then says, let the sea resound and everything in it. The world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, if you've ever seen such a thing. Let the mountains sing for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. He's really carried away, isn't he? He's not unique. There are other places that talk about nature praising God, famously about trees clapping their hands. If, again, you've ever seen a tree clapping its hands. But actually, what he's doing probably is he's looking at the things around him and he's seeing the way in which they respond to the elements about them. And he says, this is a sign of praise. Now, of course, a mountain is an inanimate object. It has no life in it. A river is inanimate in many respects. It has perhaps living creatures inside it, but the water itself is not living. How can it possibly respond in these ways? Well, if you've ever stood by a brook, a fairly shallow brook, and watched it trickle down, and a fast-running brook, let's say, and as it hits the various stones and obstacles in the way, have you noticed the way the water kind of slaps as it gets churned up? 
You could see, couldn't you, how he might describe that as being the clapping of hands. In the mountains, one of the things that you sometimes find when you get into the hills is that as the wind blows, that actually it starts to howl and make a sound. That could be the mountain singing. In other places where it talks about the, the uh, leaves of the trees clapping their hands, again, when you, you hear the, the leaves rustling together, it could be that, couldn't it? I shall remember standing um, uh, in a particular area and, and there was a bit of space between um, there was Lisa and myself and uh, we were looking over um, a fairly flat open area and on the other side um, was a, a complete wood full of silver birch trees. And if you've ever listened to the silver birch when the wind blows, it's magnificent. The rustling of the leaves is something else. And as we were standing there, a gust of wind just came along, and all of a sudden it was absolutely still, and it was just as though the leaves of the trees and the trees themselves suddenly burst into life. And this beautiful little rustling sound that the silver birch makes. But it's not the only tree to do that. Many trees will do it. And so you can look around and say, nature is praising God. Is it literally pra praising God? Well, no, it's not consciously doing that, I'm sure. But the psalmist says this is a sign that all of creation is in praise and wonder of God. Now, I played that little trick on you earlier as we started our service today of asking you to turn to somebody and tell them they're amazing, for that person to then come back to you and ask, why am I amazing? Um, and of course, when you do that, and then you're forced to give a response to the question, it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to think off the top of your head, my goodness, what can I say about this person as to why they're amazing? And okay, probably we broke down more into laughter than we did actually giving reasons, but I use that as the illustration of what praise is all about. That we're saying to God, you're amazing, you're an incredible God, but hang on, if God was to come back and question you and say, why did you say that? What would you say? How would you answer him? How would you respond to his questioning? Well, some of us might say, um, I was just praising you and worshipping you and telling you that you're an amazing God because it's Sunday and I always come to church and do it on Sunday. Is that a good reason? I'm doing it because, oh, hang on a minute. Well, actually, I, yeah, I, I'm feeling happy. So now the praise of God depends on me and my feelings. But there are a lot of people like that. They say, do you know, I don't feel like worshipping God today. I'm not going to ask for hands up, but I wonder how many of you have ever said, oh, I don't feel like going to church today. Now, church is not the only place you can worship God, of course. But it is our primary expression of worship when we come together as the body of Christ. And when we start saying, I don't feel like going to church today, we're actually snubbing God himself. Because we don't want to be part of his body. We don't want to be joining with them in jubilant praise. And one of the things that you notice about when... God is praised that, yes, you do get the occasional individual, but praise is more concentrated on large crowds. So the psalmist here says, everybody praise God. Not one or two people, not individuals, not if you're feeling happy, praise the Lord. Not if you've had a good week, praise the Lord. But everybody do it. So when you come, you need to be asking yourself the question, why am I here? What am I doing? Why am I praising God? Why have I come to declare that God is incredible? That he is like no other? That he is absolutely stunning, astounding? Why are we doing it? 
And that's the question we need to be able to answer in order to be able to praise from the heart. Now, there is an argument that says, regardless of whatever God has done, we are called to praise him. And I believe that's true. And it does not matter. Let's just imagine for a moment that God had shown no love towards us whatsoever. Would we still be required to praise him? Yes. Now, there might be some people who would say, why should I praise a God who doesn't love me? Why would I praise a God who has pronounced judgment on me, who's turned his back on me? The answer is that it's not about you, it's about him. And so we praise him all the same, regardless of whether he's shown us love or not. Thankfully, he has shown us love, great love. So I want to turn to, to look a little bit more at the reasons the psalmist gives for why he's praising. And let's face it, he's kind of gone off the deep end with his praise here. He's let himself go. What can possibly make the writer of this psalm so ecstatic about praising God? Because if we could find the answer to that, it might help us in our own praise. Could we possibly be as ecstatic about our praise as he is about his? Why is he so excited? Why is he so keen to worship God in such jubilance? Well, you don't have to go very far in the psalm to start getting the answer. In fact, the answer begins to come in verse 1 when he tells us that the Lord with his right arm or his right hand and holy arm has worked salvation. The right arm was always seen as the arm of power, of strength. It was the arm which the soldier were going to battle with and use. The left was used for defending, a shield perhaps. The right was used for the attack, the right arm. And there are other images that we could go into, I'm not going to bore you with them this morning, as to why the right arm was always seen as the arm of power. But it was always seen as it. And of course we note that in most of us, most of us, the dominant arm is the right one. We are right-handed. There are some of us who are exceptions, and we don't want to be prejudiced against anyone who's left-handed here, because left-handed people are absolutely wonderful and brilliant. I'm one of them. Um, but, but most of us are right-handed, and so you tend to, with that dominant right hand, do things. So it was always seen as the arm of power and of strength, of honor and of glory. And so he says it's with the right arm that he has been able to procure salvation. That's the first thing. But then, of course, we might ask the question of the psalmist, what salvation exactly are you talking about? What does it mean when he goes on? Verse 2, the Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. Actually, we've seen that in the two other psalms that we've looked at, Psalms 96 and 97, that there was always about the fact that God had revealed salvation to all of the world. The whole of the world has seen the glory of God. The whole of the world has seen his salvation. And again, the psalmist here comes with the same song. He's praising for the same reason. Salvation has come and the whole world has seen it. The whole world has seen the salvation of God. They've seen his righteousness, that God is not an unjust God, that everything about God is right and fair and just, that he is therefore a righteous God. He says there's something to praise him for. Then he goes on in verse 3. 
We've established that salvation has been um, worked, that the whole world has seen that salvation. We'll stop at seen for the moment, not necessarily receive, but seen the salvation of God. And then he goes on to say in verse 3 that he has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God through the house of Israel. God has loved Israel. And for this reason, he says, we are celebrating and joyful. I want to just remind you of what the Lord said through the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 31 and verse 3, he says this. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Then comes the praise. And again you will take up the tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again you will plant the vineyards on the hills of Samaria. And it goes on and on about how they will be blessed. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you, drawn you back into God through my loving kindness. The psalmist is very much aware of God's everlasting love. That everlasting love was made known to Israel through a covenant. And I don't want to get bogged down in covenants today, but... But a covenant that God has made to his people is a promise that he will never, ever go back on. He will keep his word, his promise, and he has promised his love towards Israel. I will never take it away from them. I will always be with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. That is what the psalmist is praising. He's saying, this is incredible. You're an amazing God. So what's the circumstances surrounding this psalmist? Well, I can't say for sure of the circumstances in which it was written. Perhaps this was a psalm that was written after the exiles returned from their captivity in Babylon. That would be one possibility. In which case you could understand, couldn't you, that he would be calling back to those words of Jeremiah, thinking back to them. I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've, I've drawn you through the loving kindness. I will restore you. I will rebuild Israel. And you can imagine that as they go back and they come into Jerusalem again, as they re-inhabit the city, that they look and say, isn't God great? He's been so faithful. That would be one possibility. But suppose, suppose for a moment that the psalmist is writing pre-exile, before they were taken into captivity. Well, what then? If he was writing somewhere in the time of David or soon after, he might be looking at the fact, for example, that Israel was seen as a great nation at that time one of the most powerful in that part of the world. It was rich. It was influential. It was a fruitful place. They had everything they needed. They were prosperous people. And he could be looking to that and saying, see how God brought us out of Egypt, led us through the wilderness, into a land of our own, and look how he's established us. Who could ever imagine that once we who are wandering for 40 years around the desert, barrenness, nothing there, struggling, and having to just rely on the Lord's provision day by day for food and for water, who could have imagined that one day we'd be in this glorious position where here we have sitting in Jerusalem, a temple that has been built, particularly if it was after the time of Solomon, a temple that has been built that is the glory of God, the joy of Israel, 
and the wonder of the whole earth. People came from absolutely hundreds of miles around to look upon Solomon's temple. It was so incredible. It was indeed a tourist attraction. Yes, they did have tourist attractions even in those days. The tourists came to look at the temple and marvel at how magnificent it was. So whether or not the psalmist is writing pre- or post-exilic, he'd have good reasons to look and say, look how God has rescued us. The problem with that is that it's only part of the story. And what we see in the physical nation of Israel, even in the glorious temple that was built, in the restoration of Israel after the exile um, from Babylon, where they came back in and re-established them, all of that is a picture of a much greater salvation to come. The whole earth can indeed see the glory of God through Israel. Israel was the model nation, I've said many times before, that God was trying to show the whole world from the very beginning that he loved them, that he wanted to enter into relationship with them. We find that God started with Adam and Eve, and everything was great, everything was wonderful, God would meet direct with them, and we get that beautiful picture in Genesis of how in the evening that God would come and commune with his created beings on that one-to-one scale. Mind-boggling, so much so that we try and explain it away because we can't imagine God actually coming face-to-face with a human being and speaking with him. But that, of course, was before sin entered into the equation. And when sin entered in, it was at that point that, of course, God could no longer commune with man in the same way, that he has to be separated from God. And the relationship with God has never been the same since. But all the time, God has been working through salvation. And so he has tried to show us and demonstrated to us that there is only one possible way that salvation can occur. And he does it like this, because human beings, we're fixers. We like to try and fix problems. That's why we go around all the time looking at at situations saying, how can we improve it? How can we make it better? It's all part of being human, really. And we do the same with our relationship with God. We recognize that things aren't as good as they could be. And so mankind tries to get back to God in whatever way he can. And hence we get religions that have popped up all over the world that have tried through human effort to get to God. But God says, these are useless. You cannot get back to me. There is a gulf that is so vast that you cannot possibly cross it. There is a chasm between you and me. And there is absolutely no way that you can get across that chasm. It is too great. It's too wide. You can't build a bridge. You can't jump it. You can't fly over it. You can't get there. It's too big. The only possible way is if I come to you, if I build the bridge. And that's in effect what God is saying to us. But mankind, nevertheless, has tried in futility to try and make things better. And we still do it. We do it as individuals. That's why we often protest. You know, I'm not a bad person. Why would God not love me? Well, he does love you, but why would he send me to hell just because I didn't act in the way that you Christians say I should act? Something along those lines. But then you see God has shown and demonstrated the futility of human beings trying to reach God. We find that One of the things that happens is that man starts to try and climb up to God. And Genesis chapter 11, we have this huge, great tower that is being built. Level on level, it goes up and up and up. And this great tower, which was not a unique one, 
These towers were often built in the ancient world. They were called ziggurats. And the idea was there was a staircase that went around the tower and you could kind of climb up and up and up and up until you got right up to God and get as close to him as you possibly can. And God says, it's futile. Let me show you how useless your tower is. And we get this mix-up of languages. Anyone who has ever had to try and communicate with someone in a foreign language, and that's probably most of us, will know how difficult it is to communicate. You will know about all the misunderstandings that can take place when you can't speak the language. You will know that it is very difficult to build something, to grow in something, to develop something when communication is poor. Communication with mankind, one with another, was destroyed. But actually that's just a symptom of a greater communication breakdown between God and mankind. And God says, you're not speaking my language. Therefore, you cannot hear my voice. And you're trying to get to me in ways that I've not told you to do. You won't get there. So you have that kind of building up, don't you? You also have, and I'm sorry, I forgot to, to mention before that, it comes, of course, Noah. And, of course, we see that God shows there that actually even if you reduce mankind right down to the finest people that are there, if you try and bring it down to, to the perfect people and try to rebuild the world from the most perfect, godly people that exist on earth, you will fail. You will fail. And so... That's what God does. He says, let me demonstrate to you. Let me wipe out everybody else. Out, I'm going to leave Noah and his immediate family. And through them, the most righteous people on earth, I will repopulate the earth. But sin was still there. It was not dealt with. And people became just as sinful again. And you cannot create a superior race of people like that. It is sadly the very thing that Hitler tried to do as well. It was never going to work. Never. You can't do it. It's what we're trying to do with genetic engineering. When we start to look at human embryos and say, actually, we could play with this, and we can put in the genes that we want to create this superhuman the human who will be disease resistant, who will be super intelligent, who will have all the desirable uh, features and looks that human beings are after. So we create these beautiful, intelligent, superhuman beings. Is that the way forward? Of course not. We are never going to eradicate human problems that way because the deeper problem is sin. It's not that you don't have the particular features that are seen as being in at this particular stage in history. Or that you have got a particular health issue that is genetically right. That is not the issue. The issue is sin. God then takes Abraham and he takes one man he says, okay, I've just proved to you that by reducing the whole of the world down to the most righteous people, you cannot restore relationship with me. I've proved to you that by climbing towers, you cannot get to me. Now I'm going to prove to you that by taking one man and through that one man creating one nation, that this is only part of the answer, but again, it's not going to get you all the way. And so the Jews in Jesus' time were arguing, we are Abraham's children. How dare you tell us that we don't know God? John chapter 8, have a read through. How dare you speak to us in that way? 
But of course, Abraham was the father not of the nation of Israel so much as the father of all who have faith. Because Abraham was the man of faith. The child that his offspring were reckoned by was not the child of natural birth, but the child born of faith. It was when he believed God and trusted God that he would have a son through his wife, who was already uh, advancing in years, and when he believed that and believed it for 25 years, that finally he receives the answer in Isaac. And it's through Isaac that we get Jacob, and through Jacob that we get the tribes of Israel, and the nation begins to expand. And God says, I want to use this nation, and this nation is going to be a model of how my people ought to be. But of course, we see again and again and again that the nation of Israel failed. They turned against the Lord. They worshipped idols. They didn't obey him. And finally, God says, enough. This nation is not acting as it should be. This nation is not a good example to the other nations around. How on earth will the nations around throw away their idols and their black magic and their dark arts and all of their, their worship of Satan? How will they ever throw that away and turn to Israel's God if Israel acts in such an apostate manner? If Israel is not faithful, if Israel does not demonstrate the greatness of God, how will they ever follow suit? And of course the truth was that the nations, rather than coming and taking Israel's God and saying, we want to follow your God, truly he must be king of kings and lord of lords. Israel started turning to the nations and said, can we come and worship your Baals? And can we offer up sacrifices to your gods? It worked the other way around. Sin pulled them down. And God says, you see, this hasn't worked too. So finally, God says, let me show you the one and only way. And he sends the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus comes born, yes, into the house of Israel, as you would expect. But he's different. He's different. Because he is a son of God, the son of God. He's directly from God himself. He is God himself. And yet somehow or other, there's that incredible mystery of how God and humanity have been fused together in the being of Jesus Christ. He walks the perfect life. He sets the perfect example. And then ultimately, he dies the ultimate death. Never fault him in anything that he did or said, so that we can have salvation. See, as Acts 4 tells us, that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. It's only through Jesus. And so in a sense, the psalmist here, yes, he can see some good things that are happening in his time, which speak of the wonder and the glory of God and the salvation that he's given to the nation. But he's also speaking prophetically. He's looking to the future, when the shadows that he is seeing, the foreshadows, become the reality. The reality is Jesus himself. When he comes, he will save the world. And so Jesus said to, to the people around him that I have come to save. I have come to save. That's the purpose why I'm here. I want to save you. And in order to save you, I will go to the cross. I will pay the penalty that for years and years and years you've been going to the temple and every year there's the sacrifices made, many sacrifices, thousands upon thousands of, of sacrifices made. Every Passover in the time of Jesus estimated that a quarter of a million lambs were slaughtered. 
but not a single stain of sin was ever removed from all of those deaths. Jesus becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist observed on seeing Jesus walking towards him. Here he is. This is the one that brings you salvation. And so we're able to look back to the cross, whereas the psalmist is looking forward to salvation, we're looking back to the cross and saying, there he is. Jesus died, and by believing in him, that I also can have my sins placed upon Jesus on the cross, that the debt is paid for, that I owe nothing through faith in him. But that's only part of salvation. That's only part of it. Having your sins forgiven is one thing, but then you need new life. There are two sides of the same coin, if you like. And that's why I think that you cannot have Good Friday without Easter Sunday. A salvation, a message, a gospel that preaches the death of Jesus without his resurrection is nothing at all. Jesus had to rise from the dead again. Because if he did not rise from the dead again, what hope do you have of eternal life? But Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. And as a result, gives us hope as well as Paul makes clear through 1 Corinthians 15, that we are no longer to be pitied more than all peoples, because in fact we have received the salvation that God intended for all the world, that anyone who believes by faith can receive that same salvation. But we haven't finished there. Jesus did indeed tell us that he came in the world to the world to save, but he preceded that by saying, I've not come to judge. At least not on that first appearing of Jesus Christ, when he came in human form, born of the Virgin Mary, grew up in our world with us, walked alongside us, and eventually went to the cross. He said, I've come here at this time to bring salvation. Now the message goes out. Week after week. And has done ever since. The day of Pentecost. That the church proclaims salvation in Jesus name. Again and again and again. The problem is that so many people reject it. So many people say. I still want to do things my way. I don't want to believe in your Jesus. I want to live my life how I choose to live my life. I am king of my life. I am the one who decides what I do. I am a free spirit to do as I please. But unless we submit ourselves wholly to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will never be saved. For those people who are rebellious and stubborn and, as the Bible often describes them, stiff-necked, proud people who refuse to bow the knee before the Lord Jesus Christ. There is more to come. See, we live in a day of grace. As the Bible puts it now, is the day of salvation. But that doesn't mean that the day of salvation will last forever. There will come a time when this world comes to its end. There will come a time when Jesus does return, when the clock stops ticking. The time is up. We looked at that quite a lot last week, quite strongly through Psalm 97. Psalm 97 makes the case here of judgment very powerfully indeed. But Psalm 98 also touches on it. You see, it tells us here, that the Lord is coming, he will judge the world in righteousness and the people's inequity, it finishes up. He's coming back to judge. And for anyone who has re refused his grace and his love, and we saw that last week that we're not talking about different gods. You've got the Old Testament God who's this angry God and the New Testament God who's a God of love. He's the same God right through. 
And it's the same message right through. There is continuity right through. The difference is which side are you on? Which side of the cross are you on? Are you standing in the shadow of the cross, taking the benefits that he freely gives? Or are you on the other side, refusing to enter through? That's what makes the difference. In Psalm 98, he acknowledges that the Lord will come in a day of judgment and no one will escape. Everyone will have to stand before the Lord, great and small. Everyone will stand before the Lord, the best and the worst. We who have put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Our names are written down in a book of life. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Never forget that. Whenever you have that little whispering in the ear that says, call yourself a Christian, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Just remember there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But, on the other hand, for anyone who's still in rebellion, they will need to face the Lord and give full account for their deeds. To why they've rejected him, why they never worshipped him, why they wouldn't listen to his call and his invitation. All of these things they will need to give account for. And amazingly, that despite this judgment, and this judgment is not a pleasant thing for those who don't know Christ. Despite this, this is a reason for praise. I mean, look, in fact, as he comes to the point about the judgment of the world, suddenly, this is where the psalmist gets really exuberant, and he sees even inanimate things like the mountains and the rivers that are now praising God. Because the judge is coming. Do you know, some people would look at that and say, isn't that perverse? Isn't that a perverse way of looking at things? People are going to suffer, you're saying, if they don't turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're praising God for that? The reason being is that God is a righteous God. And therefore, he cannot let sin go unpunished. None of us likes to see evil things going on. We have been perhaps a little shocked and disturbed by the news of a murder that occurred only just up the road in this last week. How could that happen? How is it possible that somebody did that in our own community? Why? I wonder what your reaction is to that. Let's just suppose for a moment that the police had issued a statement about that or indeed any other violent crime and said, we don't think it's worth pursuing. We think we just let it be. Can you imagine the outcry? You see, deep inside us, there is an inbuilt sense that says we want justice. That's why even small children are able to declare with great vigor, it's not fair. Even small children learn that there is a difference between right and wrong, between what is just and unjust. It's not fair. And if we truly belong to the Lord, then we will also say that if God was to come along and say, do you know what? 
I don't care if people are sinners anymore. Let them have their fun. And I'm just going to let them be. And I'm going to do nothing about it. If we truly belong to the Lord, we will cry out to him. It's not fair. It's certainly not right. Where is your justice, God? Where is your righteousness? Why would you allow sin to continue? Why would you allow it? In fact, what we as Christians should be praying is, Come, Lord Jesus, because we want the day of judgment. We want that because we want him to sort out the things that are wrong in this world. That we want him to sort out the things that cause pain and destruction and harm to us and to the other people in our world. We want that sorted out. That's why around the world, nations have forces to keep the peace and the law and the order. Because we want righteousness and justice. It's an inbuilt human longing. And as Christians, we want that from the Lord more than from any other. A sense of real justice. Lord, you've got to come. You have got to destroy the wicked and to save the righteous. And there in itself is a great motivation for us as Christians to say, we need to get out there and to be telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. About the righteousness that he brings because if people don't hear that message and respond to it, they are putting themselves in jeopardy. And the psalmist here says, through the nation of Israel, we are to model the salvation of God. We are to model his righteousness. Well, we can say the same thing today, that through you as an individual believer in Christ, you are to model the goodness, the righteousness, the justice of the Lord. Through us as the church, the world is supposed to see the greatness of God. It's important, therefore, that we pay very close attention to what we do, what we say, the places where we visit, how we react to situations. Because people are either seeing the goodness and the greatness and the righteousness of the Lord through us. Or they're looking and saying, hmm, why would I bother with your God? Why should I bother? If you're the kind of person that results in belief in him, why should I bother? I wonder what people say when they look at you. We are the aroma of the Lord in this world. Let me just finish with 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Two Corinthians chapter 2. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Do you hear that? Through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death. To the other the fragrance of life. As we go about our world, about our lives, the things that we do, To some people, when they see us and they see Christ in us, we are a warning to them, the fragrance of death. To others, we are the joy that says we are the people of God. Let's make sure that we don't let the Lord down and to praise him, to praise him and to praise him again and again and again for his great salvation. Let's pray.